It's time for Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell. I sit down with Andrew Maynard, who's the author of the book, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies. It's all about how sci-fi informs reality and vice versa. Up next on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 408, recorded Friday, August 2nd, 2019. Andrew Maynard, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation. I'm Jason Howell. This is the show where I get the opportunity to sit down with people who are writing fascinating things about the world of technology. And uh, today's guest actually has written about uh, just a couple of things that I love to talk about. I love to watch movies, right? I'm a big, big movie fan. Uh, Science fiction, of course, so much good science fiction happening right now. Um, And then, of course, you know, we, we work at Twit, so all about technology. And so it's, it's kind of like a couple of my passions are colliding on today's episode. Author Andrew Maynard, author of the book, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies, is joining us today. Also the director of the Risk Innovation Lab at Arizona State University and professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Great to be here. It is really fascinating uh, reading through this book and learning, like, I will say I've seen probably about half the movies, like just Mm -hmm. out out of the box, I've seen maybe half of them. Uh, Some were better than others, but... Most definitely. (laughs) Yes, we we can talk about that. Absolutely. (laughs) But, um, But great, but I definitely have new movies to add to my list, and I love having the opportunity to take a look at films that I'm already familiar with and be able to kind of take a a second look at them through a different lens. That really seems to be, I'm assuming that's probably the, you know, the, the reason that you wrote this book was to take a look at things that we're, that we're accustomed to and uh, look at them a little bit differently. It, it, it certainly was in, in part, yes. And, and using that sort of mixture of movies, some of them that are very well known, some of them that are not well known to help people think differently about the future in tech. Sure, sure. Now, um, before we kind of talk about the contents of the book and, and uh, definitely the themes that, that permeate throughout, uh, I thought we could start off a little bit talking about your background leading up to this book. Obviously, you work very heavily in um, risk in, you know, mm-hmm. in the world of, of risk and analysis, and that theme makes a big appearance throughout you know, every page of the book. Talk a little bit about what led up to uh, you writing this book. Goodness me, it, it was a long and convoluted history. Uh, so I started life as a physicist. In fact, I still consider myself a physicist. If you sort of look at Google Scholar, most of my sort of publications and citations are in my physics work. Um, but for the last, I guess, what, 15, 20 years or so, I've been deeply involved with emerging tech, but not only the the technology itself, asking fairly deep questions about how do we actually get it right. Um, so a lot of that work was spent around nanotechnology. I used to work for the US government and I was part of their huge initiative to promote nanotechnology research and development. Um, but more lately, I've been really interested in areas ranging from synthetic biology and biotech more generally, all the way through to artificial intelligence. Um, and the fundamental question has been been, um, there are some incredibly powerful technologies we're developing, but things could go really badly wrong if we don't think about what we're doing. So then the question is, how do we actually develop these technologies responsibly so we see those benefits without creating a god-awful mess? Uh, and that's sort of, that, that's sort of the, the, the long sort of route to where I got with writing this book. And I sort of as I, I started off saying I started life as a physicist, I, I'm not quite sure actually what I am these days. I used to chair the environment, ver- start that again, I used to chair the environmental health sciences department at the University of Michigan, where I was involved as, as much in toxicology as I was in physics. So I, I seem to have a, a weird set of sort of skills and areas of expertise nowadays. That's awesome, man. And you're, you're, it kind of sounds like you're following it wherever it takes you. At, at the end of the day, this really feels like like your passion, um, and you know, 
talk about movies, I have, and speaking of passion, I have to imagine if you're writing a book that combines your history and your experience and expertise in risk with films, probably <laughs> safe to say that you're at least, you know, a big fan of films. Um, you know, a book like this doesn't just appear sure. from someone who yep. isn't fond of cinema. Talk about a, a little bit about your love of movies and, and yeah. where, you know, how that led to this. So, so actually I, I, my love started within books, actually, um, and science fiction, although I, I guess like many people, I was told at a young age that science fiction wasn't real literature. So I sort of I started into it and then sort of went away from it and then sort of came back to it. And then my, my interest in movies really grew out of that. Um, and so these days, I, I yeah, I must confess I'm an avid movie watcher, though I would always put books above movies. Um, but over the years, I've really been intrigued with with what movies do and don't do, especially when they they look to the future. And of course, there's a lot of really sort of crass stuff out there. Um, but what fascinates me is even the, the supposedly crass stuff can actually provide insights that sometimes take us unexpectedly when we look at the future. Mm -hmm. No kidding. And you mentioned early on uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, which, oh, yeah. man, one of my favorite movies of all time, uh, it, science fiction or not. It's just an amazing film. Um, and and how that kind of helped shape your view. Yes. This. Yeah. So I know, as I sort of say in the book, that was actually, I, this is actually embarrassing to admit, I was a teenager at, at the time. And that was sort of one of the earliest movies that I remember. I really got into movies quite late. Uh, and as I describe, um, I watched it when it was first broadcast by the BBC in the UK. So I didn't even get to see it in the cinema. Um, and it was one of those evenings where I was desperate, absolutely desperate to watch this movie. And my parents had friends around and we only had one TV and one house wrong room of the house. So I was a real brat and I sequestered myself away in a corner of this this room with my headphones on watching TV while we were entertaining guests. Um, but you could just sort of get a sense of how important this was to me that I was willing to be such a brat in order to actually see this piece. Yeah. Yeah, such an engaging film. I finally saw it in the movie theater as well, which is a completely different experience. It, uh, it is. And, and in fact, so of course, last year was its 50th anniversary. Yeah. And I that was the first time I got the chance to see it actually at the IMAX um, screen. And it's utterly mind blowing. Now, um, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey is mentioned in your book. It isn't one of the, you know, it doesn't it doesn't get a chapter the way a lot That's of right. most of the other films in the book did. But what do you like? What's your view on 2001 and how that inf has informed the future and, and what we're what we're heading for? Yeah. So so 2001 is a it's an interesting and it's a challenging movie um, because at, at its heart, it's it's looking at what it means to be human in this this universe and what the evolution of humanity is. So it's challenging in that respect. And yet it's not a movie that is easy to create a narrative around in terms of what I was focusing on with yeah. the book. Um, it's also I, quite admittedly very weird at the end, which makes it a little difficult to write about. So a, a once a profound movie and a difficult one to write about, which is why it ended up sort of being the entree into the book rather than being a focus of a whole chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The end is a, a little strange, <laughs> right. uh, but, but beautiful at the same time. So then how did you select these movies? movies you probably ended up yeah. you know with a very large pool of movies from which to pick and i imagine you know this involved a lot of watching and a lot of note taking yep. and, and all that kind of stuff what I, what I, exactly is the connective tissue between all sure these? yeah yeah no i have a list of about a, a hundred movies and my, sure. uh, my my family will tell you a couple of summers ago it was a summer of movie watching um so i so i <laughs> had some very very <laughs> yeah, so I have some very specific criteria. And the, the big one is I wanted to tell a very specific story. So the, the book is a, a story about converging technologies. Um, so specifically looking at our journey through um, biotechnology and what we can do with genetic engineering through to um, artificial intelligence uh, and robotics through to what we can do with materials around us. And that gets into nanotechnology. And then most importantly, what happens when we merge and fuse those different areas of tech innovation together. So I was looking for a suite of movies that helped me tell that story about emerging tech in those three areas and convergence, um, and then some overarching themes. So that that was the first thing that I was looking for. Um, and that meant that there was a very specific sub pool of, of films that, that allowed me to tell that story. But then I, I had a couple of other criteria. Um, one is, I, this sounds very self-serving, I wanted movies that 
I enjoyed watching. So and I, I grew up on sort of 70s and 80s, really dystopian science fiction movies. And most of the time, actually, they're really tedious to watch. So I, I really didn't want any tedious movies in this book. I wanted exciting, sort of interesting, sometimes mindless movies that I could sit down with a, a bucket of popcorn, so to speak, and just sort of watch them and enjoy them. But the other thing that was important to me was uh, diversity of representation. So I actually went through a, a process um, specifically a, looking at a gender representation in the movies, which is really tough with science fiction because typically it's a bunch of white guys doing white guy type things. Um, and I really didn't want this to be another book about the future um, that was about my, white guys. Um, I didn't do as well as I wanted to there, but as you begin to look through the movies, you can begin to see um, probably more gender representation there than, than you would typically expect if you just put a bunch of science fiction movies together. Yeah, yeah, that's a good good way to think about it. Um, and you know, and I, not not only diversity from the characters that are within, but diversity from you know just the range of movies. You know, there's some in here that are let's say Hollywood blockbusters, right? And then there are some in here that are definitely movies that I'm like, ah, oh, I don't know if I've ever heard of that one before. Yeah, but apparently, so I need to check like, it out. So I think I think you have three uh, categories. You, you have the, the big blockbusters that everybody's heard of. Um, you have uh, one or two there that are outsiders that I think most people approaching the book will not be familiar with. And then you have the movies that utterly bomb. So I, there are at least two there that only got about 20% on Rotten Tomatoes, but they yeah. fit the narrative. Yes. What was the one that I had not? I, I think it was actually, was it Transcendence? Uh, right. I, I was interested in this one. And then when I looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes, yes, it was at 20%. I was like, ouch, man. Like I know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it was, yeah, brutal. But but it, it served its purpose well. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Um, and then as far as the movies that did make the cut, and by the way, we will talk about the movies that, that did make the cut um, and a whole lot of the themes and everything that intertwine around them. But I'm also very fascinated with what didn't. Like, it's almost like at some point, you know, you, you post a lot on Medium. Maybe someday yeah. post the list on Medium so everybody <laughs> could see. But what are some that didn't make the cut that like almost made it in there that you wanted to find some way to sandwich in, but you couldn't quite, oh, yeah. quite cut the, in? The there were two or three that, that I desperately wanted to squeeze in. Um, Blade Runner, um, oh, perhaps course. not surprisingly, um, I, I desperately wanted to get that in. Actually, I wanted to get in Blade Runner 2049, which I, I think is a, a superior movie, and I just couldn't make it work with a narrative. Yeah. Um, another one was, um, interestingly, Gattaca. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. so when, when people talk about sort of genetic technologies, um, Gattaca is the movie that always comes up as epitomizing what could go wrong there. Um, and I actually ended up discarding that because it's, it's a little long in the tooth now um, compared to some of the other movies. Um, another one was The Matrix, another classic which didn't quite sure. make it. Um, and then one that I really wanted to get in, and which I love, um, was Children of Men, oh, um, which I think is fantastic. a beautifully crafted movie. Yes. But again, I just couldn't work out how to get it to fit the narrative. Yeah. Oh, what a what a great movie. Um, if, if I were to write this book, Strange Days, may have made its uh -huh, way in. Yes. Um, yeah. Just from the perspective, for whatever reason, I've always been fascinated with this idea of like reliving memories. And then, you know, that movie introduces the black market aspect of, of trading experiences. And there was just something, It's it's got its cheesy moments, but right. and I don't know how it would have fit into the narrative, but that was definitely one movie that came to mind uh, that I was a big fan of. So, um, and then, and then actually kind of somewhat related, at least to this show and talking about, you know, life imitating art, which I think is, is a big concept here is like this idea, you know, and I've asked myself this often, uh, is the idea of, is it more common for science fiction to, uh, to create the future or that, or that art is a reflection of of the past or of the present or whatever. And uh, right. I interviewed Arthur Holland Michelle, who's the author of Eyes in the Sky. A couple of months ago, he wrote about the Gorgon state technology, the the mm -hmm. eye in the sky, you know, that, that we're hearing more and more about and how the fact that that technology at its core was created because of the film Enemy of the State, the people 
were you know went to the movie enemy of the state they were like wow you know one of the one of the creators thought wow that's an interesting idea i think i'll pursue that and then now we've got this persistent surveillance circling the sky and um you know who knows if anyone really spent any time thinking about the ethical ramifications they just thought that's really cool let's do that right 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 yeah and i you know i I don't think it's untanglable. I people study this and they they sort of end up down dead alleys. But but one thing I think is very clear anecdotally, you hear a lot of these stories about people that had the ability to push technology forward who are inspired by science fiction, whether it's it's written on TV or, or in movies. Um, and to get a, a sense of that again, it's just an anecdote. But you just need to look at some of the stuff that Elon Musk is doing, and he's been very upfront in saying that a lot of his ideas are inspired with what he reads um, and those imagined futures where a light bulb goes off in his head and he thinks, A, that's cool. B, I think I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And he really does believe that he can do that. And we're going to yeah. talk about Elon a little bit later because you, you wrote a very interesting piece on Medium um, that ties into all of this perfectly. Um, before we get there, let's take a break and thank the sponsor. And then we can kind of dive into some of the themes here and uh, kind of maybe pick apart a few of the movies. I want to pick apart every single one of them because we want people to read the book. Um, but there's just some really great questions about risk, about ethics, uh, foresight, responsibility, all these things as relates to new technology. And that really is kind of the overarching thesis of the book, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies. Uh, Andrew Maynard is the author and he's joining me here today and i'm so psyched to have you on andrew uh stand by i'm gonna go ahead and thank our sponsor and then we'll talk about more this episode of triangulation is brought to you by captera captera is the leading free online resource uh to help you find the best software solution for your business so if you happen to be tied down at work uh and you know it's it can be kind of challenging to find the software you don't want to have the search for software and have it just totally kill the fact that, you know, it's the summer, you want to enjoy your summer, it, this can kind of remove the fun from it, <laughs> going down that rabbit hole. So now you can ditch the office overtime and find options for your business in minutes with Captera. They really do make it easy for you. Read hundreds of thousands of reviews and make finding the right software for your business a breeze at captera.com slash triangulation. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. With over 950,000 reviews of products from real software users, you can discover everything that you need to make an informed decision. They really just lay it all out for you. Uh, you can search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to e-commerce software. And really, no matter what kind of software your business needs, you're going to be able to find it on Captera. Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution and fast. Uh, and you can join the millions of people who use Captera every month who are finding the right tools for their business. That can be you as well. I mean, you just go on there and, and plop in a category. You might think that your business is very specific uh, to a, you know, a very specific category uh, of, of business. And then you drop it in there and you realize wow, there's software out there that can help you manage your specific business. Uh, it really is impressive to kind of, uh, yep, yoga studio. See, if you've got a yoga studio, there you go. You've got software that'll help you manage it. <laughs> Captera believes that software makes the world a better place because software can help every organization become a more efficient, effective version of itself. Visit captera.com slash triangulation. You can do that for free today to find the tools to make an informed decision for your business. That's captera.com slash triangulation. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash triangulation. Captera is software selection simplified, and we thank Captera for their support of triangulation. All right, so this is where we get into the, the, the nitty gritty here, the ethics, the ethical considerations, which... I don't know how do, how do you feel as far as 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 how these companies these especially big companies you know, I'm I'm seeing a lot of talk about ethics boards and uh, and that sounds great part of me kind of feels like that's more about making you know news cycles than it is about making a difference mm -hmm. what do you think yeah I so I I think the whole discussion around ethics actually has got a, a little bit 
blown out of context and it's a, a bit too much of a buzzword these days yeah. so I, I a couple of confessions from from my side uh, one is even though most of my work involves risk i find risk a little tedious um, and even though i spend an awful lot of time talking about ethics i think that that conversations around ethics can sideline us from what is important and you see this with a lot of these companies so yeah for instance and um, google recently there was a big hoo-ha about them putting an ethics board together for their their AI research and the board being disbanded in a week. Um, it doesn't surprise me too much because I think they went about it the wrong way. But I, I think a lot of this talk around ethics um, deflects the conversation from questions around how do we actually ensure that these technologies um, benefit people's lives and are used responsibly and successfully. Um, and I'd say that because you can get into some really weird conversations around ethics um, that have no bearing on real life decisions. Sure. Absolutely. Well, and it, and it becomes a challenge, I imagine. I, I think I understand, at least in, in myself, why ethics is so hard, because really, if, if given the chance, we can come up with a million reasons or a million ways that things can go bad. Right. Uh, so is that a good enough reason to never move forward with any sort of innovation, I, any sort I, of progress? Yeah. And of course it isn't. Um, I'd so and I I should clarify, I mean, ethics is incredibly important because ethics is sort of how we sort of together decide on, on what is right and, and what is proper within society. It sort of sets those boundaries of the decisions we make, but it's only the first step. We've then got to work out how to operationalize that. Um, and as we do that, you can actually talk about an ethics of not innovating. So if somewhere in the future, there is the ability to resolve a challenge that we currently have, and we don't take that opportunity, you can could make the argument that actually we're behaving unethically by not innovating there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you talk a little bit in the book about responsible innovation. What is that? How is that executed? Yeah, so so this whole idea of responsibility and innovation has has largely come out of, of Europe over the last few years, but has gained international traction. And very simply, it's asking how do we innovate in ways that are going to benefit people's lives without causing unnecessary harm, as, as simple as that. Um, and it's based on this this idea that if we just put the blinkers on or the, the, the blindfold on and just innovate wildly, the chances are it's going to be like driving blind. We're going to end up sort of doing more harm than good. So why not open our eyes and have a look at what possibly could go wrong and steer away from that towards what's likely to go right? Yeah, but well, once again, you know, in my mind, I get I get it confused with the, around the fact that like I could come up with a million reasons how sure. things are going to go wrong, and, and that that feels like enough of a barrier. You know? That that that's exactly it. And and sort of one of the tricks here is avoiding paralysis by analysis, right. where you just sort of yeah, you sit there and sort of you you put your dower hat on, and you you think about sort of so many things that could go wrong that that you're just paralyzed. Um, and to me, that the trick is being smart here. Um, and understanding sort of how to identify that route forward so you can actually get to the end goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, often in a conversation around ethics like this, uh, the term, you know, another buzzword, regulation, tends mm -hmm. to come up. Uh, do, do you feel like that's necessary to, because, I mean, when, when companies the size of Facebook, the size of Google, when they're left to their own devices, like, I think publicly they like, they like to make sure that everyone knows in, in air quotes that they're doing things ethically and responsibly mm -hmm. but at the end of the day they are they're driven by their business and and uh by making money and so yep. is, is regulation the better the better approach for something like that it, it's part of the toolkit um yeah. regulation alone i can never ensure the, the the safety and the responsibility of pretty much anything but on the other hand if you don't have regulation it's it's a free-for-all so you're exactly right businesses even if you've got a business which is led by people that want to do the right thing, and, and most businesses are, if there aren't any hard stops there that are provided by regulation, it is incredibly difficult in a market economy for them to justify doing what's necessary. Mm -hmm. So regulation plays an important role, but it's only one out of many ways of, of helping people do the right thing. And then, and then where 
where my mind kind of goes also is just this idea that in the current state of, of technology, uh, innovation and disruption and all this, everything's moving at such a blinding pace. Like there is yep. no slow right now. It's it's right. all fast. And it's, I feel like almost in the last couple of years, it's accelerated even more. It's like, all right, we're doing all these things. And it, like, it's dizzying to think about the ramifications and what this leads to. How, how do we even <laughs> try to keep up yeah. with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer to my mind is agility. Um, we we learn to to be agile in identifying where things are going right and where they're going wrong and and correcting course. Uh, yeah. Whether that's on the developer side or whether it's on the the regulator side. Um, and if we can do that, at least we'll be able to see those early warnings where things maybe are heading for a sort of a, a cliff fall or something, and we can pull back from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one theme that we're hearing a lot about right now, of course, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, those things intersect a lot. One of your movies uh, is one that I'm sure most people that watch this interview have seen, Minority Report. Uh, and that really kind of targets this idea of being able to use data. I mean, I guess in the movie, it's more about precogs, but right. uh, but ultimately predicting criminal intent. It kind of feels like to a certain degree, we're moving towards that. And, and if, yep. if we in the, U in the United States are not explicitly moving towards that in this very moment, there are other places around the world where they've They've moved very briskly towards that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so and I, I, I really like Minority Report actually because even though its its basis is on this sort of science fiction fantastical idea of genetically modified twins who can predict murders in the future, at the base of it, it's, it's this question of, if we had the ability to, to churn through data and predict what people might do, what do we do with that information? Right. Um, and, and as you say, we're already seeing that. I mean, um, you've got companies like Palantir working with police forces around the country at the moment that are using that big data type approach to identify areas where there are likely to be crimes, the types of people that are likely to commit crimes. Um, and it's it's challenging and fascinating because on one hand, this sounds great. I, we don't want to live in a society where there is a lot of crime. We want to be able to work out where the problem spots are and deal with them before they become problems. So what's not to like about that? Until you start discriminating against people because of what some computer, some machine decides that they might do. And that raises huge issues of bias within the system. Absolutely. And that's, that's, I think, the, the biggest fear. Because you're right. No, everybody would probably agree that if we can make a safer society, you know, make, make life safer for ourselves, then that's, that's a good thing. But if it involves a computer making those decisions, like the other thing that comes to mind is, you know, right now we've got driverless cars mm -hmm. uh, continuing to kind of build up in capability. And at some point there will be, you know, the, the decision, the explicit decision of how many deaths are okay for a computer to yep. exact. You know, if, if a human is driving, um, you know, we're, we're human, so we're fallible, and there there will be a number of deaths in driving just based on that. But if there's a computer and there's a way, you know, to, to perfect these things or two computers come at each other, that computer then has to make the decision who's going to live and who's going to die. And yep. uh, I don't know, I, I feel like there's there's an intersection of, of ideas there, and I, don't, I still don't know what the right answer is there, because no, it just feels I, wrong to get the... Get give a computer or a robot that power. Right, right. And I I don't think there is a right answer. And this is where you get to the squishiness of ethics. Um, and ultimately, sort of what we decide is right or wrong is what we decide together is right or wrong as a society. Right. Um, and, and this is where sort of um, social psychology and personal psychology comes in. So you're exactly right. For some reason, we're okay with people killing other people to a certain extent, as long as it's within certain bounds. But the evidence is, or the indications are, we're actually not okay with machines killing people, even if they kill far fewer people. So there is a, a, almost an illogicality there. It, it isn't an illogicality because it's just how our psychology works, but we think about machines differently to how we think about people. Mm -hmm. And as these technologies develop, we've got to go through that, that conversation as a society around what we actually think is appropriate and good here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you know, another theme uh, that you talk about, and specifically the movie Transcendence, which I have not seen, we talked a little bit about it earlier, uh, ties into this idea of 
of convergence. Now, mm-hmm. a lot of the a lot of the films in here might focus on very specific things, like uh, you know, there's a film that talks about uh, kind of smart drugs and that sort of thing. What is that? Limitless and yeah. uh, genetic engineering and in Jurassic Park. But uh, convergence, of course, is this idea that it's it's like all of these moving pieces, all of these moving parts happening. And then suddenly they, they start to come together and that just makes things way more complicated, right? Right, right. Yep. And I so this is actually a, a large part of my work because to, to me, it's what happens in the intersection between those trends that is truly fascinating and truly transformative. And if you're looking at technology innovation, this is where the big breakthroughs come when somebody says, hey, I can um, manipulate the genome of some sort of animal and hey, I can use artificial intelligence to sort of accelerate that. And hey, maybe I can use robotics to actually streamline the whole process. That's where all bets are off in terms of where the future ends up. Um, So there's a huge amount of power there. Um, But in order to navigate that as a society, we've got to understand the nature of convergence and we've got to understand what's going to be plausible coming out of this versus what's total make-believe. And and so this is the the theme that I look at in that chapter on transcendence. So how do you sort of find that dividing line between the implausible and plausible when you're talking about these transformative abilities? Yeah, especially because the idea of convergence and, and all these technologies, it it is obviously potentially dangerous. It's also very exciting. It's exciting it to, is. to not know what the what the combined uh, net effect could be. Of, yeah, of and, and this goes back to, it, it does, and this comes back to sort of what I said about risk earlier. I, and I, I, I'm a scientist. I'm a tech geek. I get really excited about what we can possibly do. I don't really want to be talking about sort of risks and the downsides. And yet the reality is if we don't sort of take that sort of slightly dour view on what's what possibly might go wrong, um, the chances are we're not actually going to realize that the power of what we could achieve. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, I mean, it's probably impossible to answer, but how how do we protect against convergence going haywire? It really feels like that's so far out of our grasp. If we can't if we can't manage the the ethics and, and risk of a single technology, how do we how can we ever uh, hope to to manage the combination of them? So I I think the first step is is making sure that the people that are either making decisions or potentially impacted by the technology are aware of of what's happening and and what the possibilities are. Um, so we really cannot predict what's likely to happen, but we can sensitize ourselves to things that are probably a bad idea or things that probably need to go a little bit more slowly or things that we need to prepare ourselves for. Um, And some of that actually is really simple. So if you look at the difference between, say, a a company that is so excited about their technology, they're not even having conversations about what might possibly go wrong. They're not even entertaining that or or building that into their decision-making process. The chances are they're going to be blindsided. On the other hand, if you have a company that even for a few minutes each week, they take the time to start talking about things that are plausibly likely to go wrong and what is a company they're going to do to head them off on the pass, that then becomes transformative because you're going from absolutely nothing to at least doing something in small steps that could get you into a good place. Yeah, yeah. Do you see um, many examples of of companies creating these technologies that are actively considering the the dangers or the the, the possible influence of convergence? Yeah. So you, it's certainly a conversation in some companies. I I would say quite candidly, I don't think that those conversations are in a helpful place in in many cases. So again, if you go back to companies like Google um, or even DeepMind that, that's developing artificial intelligence um, capabilities, they are deeply concerned about what could possibly go wrong if they develop incredibly powerful or, or increasingly powerful artificial intelligences, um, which can then take us into very difficult places. Mm-hmm. But they don't know how to frame those conversations. So it, it gets back to this idea of paralysis by analysis because they're not quite sure which questions to ask or how to ask them or how to respond to them, they end up sort of creating these barriers that don't necessarily need to exist. There are very few instances of of companies that have have taken a a much more measured approach to this. And it's actually something that we do here just as a sort of sideline. We're actually working with entrepreneurs and startups to help them understand how to ask relevant questions and take action without being completely bogged down by those conversations. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like very important work um, and uh, kind of raising their awareness around that. Um, And I also feel, and, and I'm probably 
definitely guilty of this. It's easy to kind of focus on the potentially negative aspects, right. you know, the, the the doom and gloom of things. But there are also, you know, very positive attributes of, of everything that we're talking about. Do any examples come to mind as far as how convergence is actually helping and improving quality of life today? Oh, goodness me. Um yeah, so though it, it's always very muddy. Um, yeah. But for instance, if you look at, at what is happening in the biomedical sciences, um, we're beginning to make breakthroughs um, on a numerous fronts, um, all the way from um, drug discovery through to understanding how the, the body works and how we can intervene in, um, in it, that are dependent on multiple strands of, of tech innovation. So um, for instance, if you're looking at, at drug delivery, we're now beginning, or uh, drug development and delivery, we're now beginning to to work with material science, with nanotechnology, so we can actually get drugs to where they need to be in the quantities and the form they need to be far more efficiently. We're using artificial intelligence to help us divide, decide design those systems and actually design the therapeutics. And then, of course, you've got the, the biologics and the, the chemicals in there to actually do that. So that's an area where we're actually beginning to take sort of um, leaps and bounds by combining these different types of technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, the, the other example, which I, I think we'll get to, we're seeing is in neuroscience, where we're beginning to be able to do things because of that convergence between AI and robotics and material science and neuroscience. Yeah, well, let's talk about neuroscience. What What is the film, remind me of the film that, that focuses on this and uh, why did you select it? Yeah. So, um, in fact, actually, there are a couple of films. There's yeah. um, the, there's Limitless that looks at the the, the drug That's side right. of things That's in right. terms of smart drugs, and then Transcendence is the the one that, that begins to look at um, what happens when you fuse somebody's mind with a, a supercomputer. Um, and I both of those were in there for different purposes. The Transcendence one um, was there because there is so much talk about at some point as being able to develop computers or computing substrates um, that are so powerful that we could effectively upload the human mind to them. I, it's actually something I don't think is possible because we're making some fundamental errors there. But this is something that's driving a lot of um, innovators and entrepreneurs along at the moment thinking that in our head, we, we just have a basic computer. And if only we can make a bigger, better computer, we could transform what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, um, so let's see here. I'm, I'm looking through the list, and there's so many good films here. Uh, obviously, Jurassic Park. Everybody's seen Jurassic Park. <laughs> right. I, do, I, I'm and, not I, and I've got it. I've got to say, actually, I, so Jurassic Park was made in 1993, and yeah. I was I was blown away by how good it still is. Actually, oh, I have to it's, it's a very well crafted movie. Yeah, well, and and I, I think for me, you know, one of the risks of going back to a film like that is okay, do the special effects hold up? And I remember at the yeah. time, special effects were as good as it gets. Um, so I hope that they still hold up. I need to check it back yeah. out. But um, no, no one's thinking that we're going to bring uh, dinosaurs back to life, right? That's that's <laughs> never going to happen. No, no. <laughs> Let's hope. But, but people are using similar technologies to uh, um, try and bring back things like woolly mammoths. I mean, they're not dinosaurs, but they are an extinct species. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've you've now got a. Um, a an effort in Siberia um, called Pleistocene Park, Pleistocene Park, um, which is sort of a play on Jurassic Park, where they're actually intending to bring back flora and fauna from the Pleistocene period to mimic what it was like 30,000 plus years ago. Oh my um, so yeah, so, so people right. are playing around with these ideas and you've got this whole sort of area of de-extinction where people are using DNA to bring back um, animal species that no longer exist. Okay, so so we will be bringing back dinosaurs. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> right. Let's let's just be or, honest. Or, or, some, or some or something that looks like a dinosaur, maybe. So, <laughs> so actually, this, this is where it gets scary. Where somebody works out using their AI system what the DNA of a dinosaur might be like, and we actually create a brand new form of dinosaur using that. All oh, right. I mean, we're we're not very. I mean, that's that's perfectly within the the realm of of possibility, right? Uh, DNA hacking. Uh, I mean, there's just there's so many ways that we now know and are practicing things that were science fiction not too long ago, and have the ability to actually create life, right? Yeah, I, I, so so there are huge limitations there still, and the biggest limitation is if you take the code of DNA, we really still don't understand how it works. It's it's not a, a linear code like we might find in a computer, but in principle, 
there's nothing to stop us cracking that code. And the smarter our machines get, our AI machines get, the more likely they are to be able to help us crack that code. And once we do, you can effectively sort of type into a computer what you would like an organism to look like and be, and some machine somewhere will construct the DNA code for that and squirt it down into reality. And hey, presto, you've got your 21st century dinosaur. Yeah, you've got your animal printer, your animal 3D printer, right. and who knows what else. Right. Um, so you mentioned AI, artificial intelligence. I'm I'm equally fascinated and terrified by artificial intelligence because I love, I mean, and, and I feel like it's just progressing so fast, right? We're hearing these and reading these articles on research and, and you know, deep fakes and all this stuff that seemed... Uh, seemed like sci-fi even a couple of years ago and now right. suddenly not only is it possible but it's like ridiculously easy to do compared to any methods that we've had before it um x uh, machina is one example of ai in in your list but i'm sure it appears throughout because artificial intelligence right. is just has permeated so deeply talk a little bit about that and kind of where we're where we are with that right sure now. yeah so you're you're exactly right i have two or three movies there starting with 1995 Ghost in the Shell, and then going up to Ex Machina. Um, and of course, I couldn't not cover AI because, as you say, it, yeah. it's everywhere. What fascinates me, though, is it, again, is really hard to make the, the differentiation between what is plausible versus what is make-believe in artificial intelligence, especially because I, I think what we're seeing is if you look at the technology under my or un, underneath underlying current AI research, it's not that big of a leap from what we could do in the past. We've just got sort of bigger and better in terms of the, the multi-layered neural nets we're using and the data that we can put in. But the way it's transforming what we can achieve with that is really quite astounding. So small change in the underlying technology, huge, massive changes in terms of the, the social impact. So that, that's what I begin to dig at. Um, but what fascinates me here is working out what is not likely to happen. So for instance, I, another movie that didn't make the, the book is um, the original Terminator or Terminator 2, which would be a better one, sure. which has this, this sort of very dystopian scenario of Skynet sort of becoming self-aware and discovering that the one thing it really cannot stand is humans. So it tries to get rid of them. And, and this is the, the classic dystopian AI totally. scenario. It's a theme that we hear time and time and time again. Right. Everybody's worried about the robots that come back and kill us and decide that, that, they're more important right. than we are. That's right. And, and chances are that that really won't happen. But there are other things that actually that disturb me more about where technology um, with, with AI is going. So what I explore with the chapter on Ex Machina, for instance, which is such a complex and interesting movie, is what happens when machines get to understand how human psyche works better than we do ourselves so they they can then manipulate us so a machine then has a goal and it just sees humans as part of the cogs in the machine to achieve that goal and we cannot resist it because with all our biases and our illogicalities um, we're very easily manipulatable manipulatable yes yes indeed um so i'm not sure if you saw this news uh, i think this just happened yesterday but peter thiel uh you know, pretty pretty outspoken individual wrote an op-ed for the New York Times where he's blasting Google and in it he mm. refers to artificial intelligence as military technology and basically says to forget the sci-fi fantasy that surrounds it. Would you, I mean, would you agree with that? I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah, so I, I, I think you have to be broader than that. So I, I, if you're looking at the application of the technology, um, Clearly, there are huge offensive and defensive capabilities there. Sure. Um, and I would agree with him that I think we're being sidetracked with conversations about the fantasy or fantastical side of artificial intelligence. Um, but at the same time, I, the ways we're using AI, um, are both simultaneously improving society and, and eroding some things that we think are important. And that extends out to the military uses. But I don't think you can sort of tease apart military versus civil there. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned in, in the book, you wrote uh, that AI could someday lead to the end of humanity as we know it. Uh, is that hyperbole? What might that look uh, like? What do you think? 
I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the context um, was there because I, I'm sure I put a caveat on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty, I mean, I think it would be easy for anyone to say it could be, yeah. uh, it could so lead actually, to that because who the heck knows, yeah. you know? Well, 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 that's right. But I actually, I think we probably need to pull back from that, which is where I'm trying to remember the, the context. And, and part of the problem is um, it's actually very hard to see a scenario where artificial intelligence becomes self-sustaining and doesn't actually need humanity. Right. I think it's, easy to imagine a future where we give so much authority to machines that our lives are effectively controlled by machines and manipulated by machines. I think it's also possible to imagine a future where we begin to work in partnership with machines. So I mean, this is one of the, the, the more interesting scenarios that the people like Max Tegmark, a um, thinker around AI, has, has put forward, that maybe we can actually use the smarts of AI in collaboration to actually build a better world, build a better government, uh, nudge people along the lines of doing the right thing more often, get away from all this maybe partisanship and actually have something smart that's helping us live our best possible lives. Yeah, li live a better life. Um, yeah. So a couple of your chapters, uh, well, one, one in particular, especially um, thinking about climate change right now with Live a Better Life, the sure. day after tomorrow, uh, yep. and like talk, talk a little bit about, about that. I, I, I think the thing that I love about your book is you really do touch on a wide expanse of, yep. of, of topics here. And I'm happy that climate change could make it in there. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so that was, that was a challenging one because I felt I couldn't write a book about technology in the future without including climate change. Um, but I had two challenges. One is the, a really no very good climate change science fiction movies out there mm -hmm. or ones that, that I'd felt sort of fit in. And the second is it's such a big, such a complex topic that I couldn't do it justice in in one chapter. Sure. So I, I ended up with a compromise and I actually described this this in the chapter where I use the day after tomorrow, uh, not because it's the, the best climate change movie out there. In fact, it has some quite serious flaws, but it opens up a conversation about how we think about climate change and what we as humans are doing to the planet and the climate and how we begin to navigate through that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Contact is in there. Great movie. Uh, it's been a while since I saw it, so I don't know if it's one of those movies where I go back to it and I go, eh, it was all right. I, I, I would hope you go back and you think this is even better than I remember. I, okay. I, I love I love that movie, although quite interestingly, when I was writing the book and I, I sent the first draft to my um, publisher, they came back to me and said, yeah, this looks great. We we have no idea why you put contact in there. And I'm not quite sure where the disconnect was because to me, that's one of the most important movies in the book. Okay, so then explain why it's the most important. I think when I think of contact, I think of something that's outside of our control, right? That that right. there is a, a, an alien or entity outside of, of the world as we know it, and that becomes the story. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about something no, else? No, it, it, it isn't. So I, of course, that's what drives the, the story of contact um, along, the, the idea that we, we make first contact with a, an alien intelligence. What I love about the, the movie, though, is that it explores the nature of science, what it is to be a scientist, and how that intersects with belief. Um, and so too often, I think we, we hear this narrative around there being a disconnect between what you believe or what the truth is in science. And there is no connection between belief and science. Um, what Contact does and what Carl Sagan does in his writing with that is to say, actually, the two are closer than you might imagine. And being a scientist is not being a cold calculating person, but it's being driven by a deep belief. The only difference between somebody who leads a, a faith based life versus a science based life is in in the, a faith-based life, you accept that belief as truth. In a science-based life, you try and show the evidence for that belief. Um, and I just love the fact that it captures that, that basis of belief in both those different strands in the movie. And to that, to me, that is really important when we're beginning to think about the future, when we're beginning to think about tech innovation, and we're beginning to think about what it truly means to be human in the world that we're building. And this is kind of the beauty of the book is that, you know, it, a movie like Contact guaranteed when I saw it, you know, however many years ago, 
not not watching it through that lens, but you read through the book, you read through kind of your your walk through the summary of of the movie uh, into kind of your your analysis and breaking it down to all these points that we're talking about today, and then you re-examine the movie, and I'm sure mm-hmm. you see it with a, through a different lens. And so, yes, I will definitely revisit Contact and uh, see see how that interplays and how that changes. Uh, that's great. So we, we mentioned a little bit earlier, we mentioned Elon Musk. You actually, you post a lot on Medium. So anyone who's mm-hmm. who's interested in the book should also find you on Medium because you're, you're putting a lot of things out there, both on, on Medium. Um, I think it's the one zero. Um, yeah. I mean, so we've got one zero, the, the new tech platform as, yeah. as well as sort of my own area on Medium. Yes. Yes. And uh, you actually posted not too long ago, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even last week on Elon Musk's new startup, Neuralink. And this Neuralink is just, it's definitely one of those technologies that when you hear it, you're like, okay, this is this is the future, but way sooner than I thought. Uh, yeah. So maybe before we kind of talk about your post, uh, talk a little bit about what the technology promises, because it's total sure. science fiction. It, it absolutely is. So, so the inspiration behind Neuralink is a, a device that was popularized by the science fiction writer Ian M. Banks, um, a, a neural lace, the idea that sometime in the, in the future, we'll be able to have this this overlay um, to our our brain, this electronic overlay that interfaces with every single neuron, every single synapse, um, so that we vastly expand what we're capable of doing because we're now connected within the the whole sort of cyber world with our brains. And and Musk thought, surely this is possible. So he established Neuralink to begin to to develop the first neural lace. Um, Of course, there, there are a long, long way from sort of achieving anything like that. But what they have done is that they've made some really very interesting breakthroughs in terms of how we can begin to interface within sort of specific clusters of neurons within the the brain and to do that in a way that I don't think anybody else is doing at the moment. From what we know, from what we've seen from Musk, I mean, obviously he's a man with a lot of really big ideas and he's got the money to to kind of back it up. So he, he makes promises that... Uh, you know that that many believe he can actually fulfill. Maybe someday we'll we'll go to Mars and <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that whole thing. But do you do you feel from what we know about Elon Musk that he's cognizant or his team is cognizant about the ethical the the risk aspects of technology or that he's just kind of pummeling through? I, uh, I think he's happens. I think he I think he's he's just like a, a little school kid that's the sort of pushing as hard as possible to do the the cool stuff that he can imagine. Yeah. Um, I, so so I, I should sort of temper that a little bit. And I've, I've actually got a huge amount of respect for him in terms of sort of how he goes ahead. Um, and you see with some of his conversations around artificial intelligence, he obviously does think about the, the downsides or potential downsides of what he's doing. Um, but at the end of the day, especially if you're looking at technologies like um, Neuralink, it's all about the technology, all about the capabilities and all about changing the paradigms around how we do things. So for instance, with Neuralink, when they were recruiting, they had a a big advert on their website up that said, no neuroscience required. And this is typical Musk. He basically sort of says, um, sort of, this is your field, you're stagnated, I'm going to bring some new thinking from people that have no idea sort of how your field works, but they're going to bring in that expertise that's going to transform things. It's what he did with Tesla and electric cars. Mm -hmm. And he hopes it's going to happen now with with neural interface. Um, but what's driving that is an excitement about what the technology can do and not so much thinking about um, where it might lead us. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, and you actually make, a, I, I felt like a chilling point that I just hadn't considered when it comes to this sort of uh, technology in your article, the idea that support, almost like tech support uh, yep. for a computer interface, it better last forever because if it doesn't, uh, you know, that support goes away. Maybe it's outdated. Maybe it's unsupported hardware at that point. We're going to be running around with that stuff in our brains. And what does that mean? Yep. Yep. A huge issue. And I, I, it's one that I bring out in the book. And we're already seeing this with prosthetics um, um, that, that people have in them that are life saving. Their life depends on them. And yet they're owned by the company that made them. And if they're not regularly, regularly updated and maintained, where does that leave you? Um, and it, as soon as you begin to put tens of thousands of probes into your head and stick a chip on the outside of them, um, and somebody says either you have to pay us a lot of money for the next upgrade, 
upgrade or we're not going to maintain that, um, that leaves you at a severe disadvantage. Not only a severe disadvantage of like maybe you can't afford to do it, but say you've lived with whatever the advanced capabilities that this gives you for 10 years and suddenly for whatever million, millions of, uh, of possible reasons that you no longer can operate with that hardware in your head, maybe, maybe right. it needs to be removed or maybe it's unsupported or whatever. Now you've got to readjust to learning to live life without whatever that that expanded uh, capability that's, was, and that's d debilitating. I would imagine that's that that's that's exactly it. Yeah, and there are all sorts of very deep questions that that come up here. And I think what is happening with neural interfaces in particular is we're pushing the boundaries there. So it's it's one thing to put a sort of a, an ICD um, on your heart to make sure that, that it keeps on beating. That's just one device. As soon as you've got 10,000 probes um, going into your, your cortex, that's 10,000 bits of stuff that either could go wrong or if you're going to pull them out, it's going to be deeply disruptive. And I, I think we have no idea how we're going to navigate that yet. Yeah, no. <laughs> and and also another thing that kind of comes to mind in all this too, and I think this is probably a, a, a big problem why maybe some people don't think about these things is when you when we start talking in these ways of like, and what about in the future when suddenly our brain computer <laughs> right. interface doesn't work and you know we, we're you know, lower down on a, on a two-tiered society or whatever, it kind of sounds ridiculous. It kind of feels ridiculous to have those conversations, right. even though they're right. equally important, but it does feel a little like we're writing it, science fiction as we go along as well. It, it does, and it's really easy to sort of see, well, that's just fantasy, it'll never yeah. happen. And, yeah. and, so, and, and this is actually back to the nature of convergence. I, part of the nature of convergence is that it's really clear that it's never going to happen until it happens. Yeah. Um, and it's almost an overnight flip. Um, and so the, the challenge we've got is how do we have those conversations that prepare us for the flip um, without just totally bogging down progress? Yeah. All right. So we're kind of rounding things out here. I have a few questions just from a general perspective. What what technology excites you the most today? What is the thing that you're most excited about? Oh, goodness me. If you had to uh, pick one. <laughs> that's a really tough one um, because I, my, I'm a professional warrior, so I always see the downsides. Um, I'm trying to find the positive here, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, so I think every technology we're talking about, I, I can see exciting things about it. So I, a couple of things that, that really intrigue me at the moment. Um, one is gene editing. Um, and again, this is sort of the, the, the geek in me. The, this idea that with gene editing techniques, and when you combine them with AI, we're beginning to crack the code of DNA, but not only crack it, work out how to take those computer simulations and squirt them down into real life, real cells. Yeah. Um, that actually excites me. Um, it, it deeply scares me with what we can do. Um, but at the same time, um, it excites me because what we're doing is we're seeing a transition between our, our evolutionary heritage where what we are is defined by evolution and we're taking biology by the scruff of the neck and we're saying we're actually going to redesign you. Um, and I'm fascinated to see where that takes us. Yeah. So that that that's one of the big ones which I, I'm watching really closely. And I just to give you an example, little example of that, a uh, piece of work we're doing at the moment is actually looking at the challenges and opportunities of gene editing in sports. Um, so one of the, the challenges here is I, geneticists will tell you that you can't define how to recode for traits such as strength and intelligence and stuff like that. But that's not going to stop anybody that wants to create the, the next generation of master athletes. So you can imagine that at some lab somewhere in China, say, someone is working with, with families or will be very shortly to work out how to program their offspring so that they become master or super athletes in 20 years' time. Um, and that's going to completely change how we think about athletics and doping and sport um, because of what we're able to do with gene editing. Not, I mean, and not just that. If we're if we're creating, let's say, physically superior beings, you know, with with major right. uh, physical attributes and, and capabilities that are beyond the normal human, I mean, that creates an inequity in a, in a lot of other facets, not just sports. It it absolutely does. Now, the the one saving grace is because we really don't know what we're doing. That the chances are it will be very hard to just program in those traits. Yeah. On yeah. the other hand. 
because people are going to be trying to do this, there could be a lot of collateral damage on the way as we try. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure about that. Uh, finally, uh, you've studied and written about good science fiction. Uh, when will you be writing your own sci-fi script? Oh, now that's an interesting mm -hmm. question. I done a lot of analysis here. You could probably write a really yeah. good book for a movie. So it's it's not on the agenda <laughs> at the moment. But yeah, right. you know, if, if if anybody's interested in a contract, um, yeah, you know where I am. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm, I'm sorry that I put that on your lap, but I'd be very curious to know what you came up with. It would be like yeah. a Frankenstein film of all of these all of these traits and everything <laughs> right, right. into one amazing sci-fi movie. I I have all the faith in the world. Uh, Andrew Maynard is the author of the Technology and Morality of sci-fi movies uh definitely worth checking out uh you can you know, of course you can find it in book form you can also listen to it on audible it's very good uh in audiobook form and uh, it's just going to give you a new perspective on some of the sci-fi movies that you've either never seen or that you've loved uh that you've seen you'll see them through different eyes andrew thank you so much for coming on and talk with me today i really it's been an absolute it. pleasure thank it's, you it's really uh, really awesome to meet you and best of luck uh with your movie that you're totally working on Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we do the show every Friday starting around 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 18.30 UTC. You can always watch us live by going to twit.tv slash uh, live. If you want to go to the show page for Triangulation, that's twit.tv slash TRI or twit.tv slash Triangulation will take you there as well. There you can find all of our episodes. This is episode 408, so you've got 407 other interviews to catch up on. No big deal. Uh, and you can watch all of those. And, and, I mean, just tons of great interviews, just like today's interview uh, with Andrew. I'm Jason Howell. I love doing this show, so thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, sit down with some amazing people uh, each and every week. And... Uh, thank you to Anthony uh, for booking Andrew and for uh, producing this show. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. 